it should have started. Okay. Yeah, it seems that it's recording now. Okay. Okay. And it's Great. using scripting also. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Four is All right. Again. Yeah. Well, thank you, Renee. And also, well, thanks a lot for the invitation. I, um, yeah, I'm very happy to be here today and uh, well, share the findings that we have with this very interesting uh, research topic. Um, just to give you a bit of context, uh, last year we were working for the Center for Sustainability and well, my colleague Ankita, Sylvia and I were thinking on, on these ideas about rethinking supply chains in a post-COVID era. Um, this was also supported by, well, by Rene Klein and also Profer, Professor Connie Wacker from TU though. And uh, yeah, we were exploring like a specific case studies that were interesting for us. Uh, well, semiconductors appears one of the big ones because, uh, well, you will see the whole story in, in a few minutes. Uh, but I mean, you can imagine the relationships. Semiconductors are related with high tech sector, right? It's the things that goes into electronics, also to automotive. So any disruption in, in this supply chain, it's quite important for, for the whole economy. Um, so to give you an overview of what I'm going to present today, uh, I will focus on three aspects. The first one is about, uh, well, just give you a bit of context about COVID-19 and the global supply chain impacts. The second one is, regarding more specifically the case study. So um, all the supply chain, we saw it with the, from a resilience perspective. So the first thing that I want to do is to talk about what is a resilience in a supply chain and then um, moving to uh, what are the approaches that we use to interpret resilience in the supply chain. And uh, well, the final findings that is more about the system dynamics. And the last point, it's regarding the lessons that we got from this instant dynamics and also the resilience perspective. And these lessons can be translated into multiple uh, supply chains, actually. So that's very interesting. Um, all right, so COVID-19. So this is not a big surprise. I think that, well, personally, I think that I never talked to live in, a, in an era like this one in which uh, we look for a global pandemic that, uh, well, because all of our resources on social media, I think that was even more intense in general. So, um, well, it's clear that COVID got an impact on, on our way of life, and not only from the health and human perspective, like the social perspective, but also from from the supply chain perspective. And um, during the last, I mean, between 2020 and 2021, it was very common to see news like this one, like coronavirus is awakening the call for supply chain management. And then we have something from UTAG about uh, the outbreak and the impact on global supply chains. And then, well, the ongoing impact on global supply chains by the uh, World Economic Forum. The point is that we got bombarded for, um, from a lot of uh, uh, news regarding COVID and also how this affects different supply chains, right? Because production was tough for a while. On the other hand, we have lockdowns that affect the demand as well. And I mean, it's just a unique opportunity to, to try to, to figure out ways in which the supply chains works and how to make it better. Um, as a, from a resilient perspective, we, what we think about supply, uh, about COVID specifically, is that this was a disruptive event, right? It's something that happened during certain period of time that actually make a, a disruption in the regular activities. Um, let me move on to the case study. So, as I mentioned, this one was uh, developed in, and, and well, we developed a white paper uh, together with the Center for Sustainability about the opportunities in the in the post COVID era. And as the title of my of my presentation mentioned, we focus on what is semiconductors. But just to give you a brief overview for those ones that are not familiar. Uh, I'm referring to, I mean, we can call that a synonym uh, chips or integrated circuits or ICs. Basically, these are the components that goes into different uh, products that we use in our daily life. And 
Well, one of the reasons why I can do this online is because we have actually semiconductors within our laptops or computers. Um, also, an important element is uh, with the cars, because, well, you know that cars are very smart right now. They have a lot of sensors and therefore they are using semiconductors within, um, within the product. And this case was very interesting, especially at the beginning of 2020, because when we go into um, what we did was to go into the statistics, especially for the Netherlands, to see how how the demand and production changed during the first year of COVID. And what we found is that actually semiconductors did great. Actually, they got even way more imports in, in the Netherlands than uh, than in the previous year which was surprising. So it's like, OK, uh, we still import this even in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, also, demand for electronics raised during the pandemic. And so that points out to very interesting ways because we were thinking, OK, is there is something within the supply chain that helps to to maintain the production and demand? Or is it or is it more a casualty, right? Um, what we noticed later on is actually that um, we start a, a semiconductor crisis at the beginning of 2021. So uh, the whole uh, narrative and dynamic in our in our research that we were exploring in real life changed very quickly, actually. <laughs> uh, and these things are the aspects that we wanted to discover, and also that I'm going to show you with uh, uh, from a, uh, using a system dynamic model that we developed. Um, before going into the approach and also the system dynamic model that we developed for this, I just want to quickly mention what does resilient mean in this context. So we're talking about supply chains, right? So there are like different actors or elements within the supply chain, and we consider the resilience as the capacity of the system to maintain its function or to adapt during a disruptive event. So I really like the analogy of the boat within a storm. There are three main principles that can help us to understand what happened um, from a resilient perspective. And um, using the, the boat and the storm, I think I, I hope that I, I, I can it, it simplify it for you. So the first principle is about resistance. So this one is the capacity or and of the system to maintain its function. So, for a boat in, in a storm, it's basically just to keep on float. It doesn't matter what happened. If, if the boats keep on float, that means that it has certain level of resistance. And the rapidity refers to the capacity of the system on recovering after the event. So let's say that after the storm, the boat has some holes on it. Well, it's how quick you can, you can make the patch on those holes in order to maintain the function of the boat. And flexibility has to be with the capacity of the system to meet their, uh, its needs uh, by switching to another uh, alternative or system. Let's say that we are in this boat and, well, let's say that we own an helicopter, then we have another system, right? And if the function was, uh, well, moving moving towards one point one point to another, then the helicopter can help us. I mean, this is a fancy subsystem, of course, <laughs> and in reality, it's very difficult to find, but this is more or less the idea. Um, you can imagine that within a supply chain that it's also very um, possible, right? Um, resistance has to be like um, just maintain the, the supply and demand uh, of the market, uh, rapidity has to be like, uh, well, with how effective are the, the production or production rates. Flexibility is more about substitution and whether there are like different diversity of supply uh, within a certain supply chain. Um, so these are the whole idea about resilience within the context of this research. The approach that we use was very straightforward, I think. We developed three steps. The first was, was uh, data collection and analysis. For this one, we did a literature review um, with over 200 records. 
Um, of course, with the literature review, we didn't get too much information about the current situation because, of course, the literature comes from the past, right? And we were analyzing a real um, a real time problem. So uh, we did, we use um, as an additional source uh, text mining techniques in order to extract whatever was within into the news. Uh, so one of the resources that we used was in the newspaper, The Guardian, and getting over well around eight eight hundred and eighty records um, during 2020 and 2021. That was the the, the period that well our time um, uh, frame there. And uh, in addition to this, we collect the information uh, from semi uh, from semi structure interviews from actors of the supply chain. With all this information, we collect and um, we develop a system dynamic model. And this is a descriptive one because we just wanted to understand what was the dynamic during these two years. And um, then we did an interpretation based on the things that we know about uh, uh, resilience, and uh, more specifically uh, based on three resilience mechanisms that I will explain in, in a few seconds. Um, let's move on to the system dynamics. So the boxes here are called level source stock. So we divided this in, 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 into, into five components that are extraction, the production of chips, and then the production of the high-tech goods, goods, and then that move on to consumers, and well, of course, you have e waste at a certain point. So if we go into the pre-COVID times, what we found is that there is a push-pull effect. So basically, the demand is driven whatever is happening in the chips production for two reasons. Of course, if the if the consumers demand more products, well, the chip producers will need will require to have more uh, production, but also they consider the forecast for demand that might take um, into consideration between three to five years because that is what it takes to build uh, an infrastructure if it's needed. Um, and this has been the, the things with semiconductors for years. Now, when we include the COVID as a variable, the first thing that we need to understand is the dynamic within COVID, right? And I think that for most of us, it's, it's, it's I mean, it, it, it was part of our life in the past two years. The government tried to take in interventions that usually leads to lockdowns to try to reduce uh, the COVID impacts, right? Now, with the lockdowns, it's where it became very, very interesting because we have a change on the dynamic. We start working from home and then demanding different things. On the, on the one side, working from home increased the demand for electronics, that increased the demand for high tech, uh, technology and therefore semiconductors. And if you see the demand for cars, um, that one has a plus less because it was a switch of the of the dynamic in 2020 uh, electronics go up while cars go down so the semiconductor industry was very happy because they could meet the demand when we start 2021 uh, it doesn't matter the lockdowns we also have the the vaccine the, the vaccine uh, programs already and uh, cars start to increase and electronics uh, still keep with the same um, with the same production so what does that mean as a, as a direction for the semiconductors? And it's basically where we start to hear the story about the, the semiconductor shortage. Um, of course, this is an oversimplification. There are more influence in this uh, dynamic, um, especially at the end of 2021 and well, the beginning of this year. We have other disruptive events such as the such as the Russia and Ukraine conflict that also affect this, the, this system. But well, as an oversimplification, this one uh, was uh, what we found. Now, when thinking about the mechanisms, we realized that uh, diversity of supply is possible within the semiconductor supply chains. And um, however, there are certain restrictions. Uh, the first one is that when you are producing a, a, a certain function for, for, for a semiconductor or an integrated circuit. And to move to an, to from a foundry to another one, you require to also to change your design. 
So that might take some time for the producers of, of products. On the other hand, it's very limited, the amount of, of semiconductor producers. So, well, the most globally known like TSMC um, basically domi and, uh, well, dominates the market. And from the extraction part also, uh, it's a very limited uh, places where we can find the resources. So, for example, uh, for silicon metal, around 60% of silicon metal come from China, for instance. So you can see that there is only a small note where you can take the materials and also when you can produce the semiconductors. Um, stockpiling, it's an option that, uh, pro uh, that high-tech producers are um, uh, thinking about. Uh, however, because it's, um, there are changes in, in, the, in the design of, of the products, um, and how quickly this move, right? So for example, with, with the smartphones, right? Like how this evolves so fast, then um, it's very difficult to have a supply that, that lasts for, for years. Of course, you need to require like a small stockpiling processes within weeks or even months. Uh, material substitution, um, it seems more from the component perspective. So right now there are no real solutions about substituting certain uh, materials for, for, the, for the ICs. So silicon metal is still predominant. Also, the recycling is, is not technical possible right now. Well, at least economically possible, I think. Uh, so uh, the way that substitution is seen is by actually um, making modularity within a product around the chip. So this is more or less the case of Fairphone, for example. Um, you never replace the computer of, or the chip of a fair phone, but you can replace different elements that can help you to last longer. Um, all these elements, and I think that I'm running out of time, so I'm going to be <laughs> briefly. Uh, all these elements we analyzed in, uh, towards three main global trends. So uh, something that come up from the news and also from the interviews is that we are in this post-COVID era, we are dealing with three main things, um, at least within the supply chain. The first one is the automatization and the digitalization of the production processes. The second one is re regionalization, that is like the, again, the near shoring or bring, bring the production back home, more or less. Uh, and, the sec and, and the third one is the circularity potential. Um, I'm going to be very briefly here, but if, if you are very interested in this, you can see the interaction between these global trends and the mechanisms in, in our white paper that we will publish very soon. Uh, but in general, I mean, you can, you can find different uh, opportunities and challenges uh, based on this. So let's pick up the mechanism of diversity of supply and the global trend of regionalization. So. Once that you are regionalist, uh, once that you decide to regionalist, uh, sorry, once that you um, decide to bring the production back, that actually can be a constraint for you for your diversity of supply because then you are limiting actually your production to one specific uh, point. While the advantage of diversity of supply is actually to take advantage of different partners uh, around the world. Um, of course, with this, I'm just thinking more on a strategic point of view. I'm not considering what are the, the socioeconomic or environmental impacts of that decision, right? Um, but then you can have an idea of how this uh, might work in practice. As a final remarks, we learned three lessons uh, during this white paper that might help um, well, the actors of the supply chain to think about these uh, disruptive events. Uh, the first one is that the resilience changed through time. I mean, when we're talking about resilience, it's, it's not a static. And this is very important because if you're resilient, if, if you feel that you can adapt right now very easily, that doesn't mean that you can adapt into the future. So you are constantly need to think about ways to to bring or provide more resilience in your in your production or supply chain. And the second lesson, and this one was more towards also the circular industry stock, is that circularity has a major potential. So, for instance, when we think about diversity of supply, 
Well, um, when when we go into circular strategies, uh, we can think about already a, some opportunities to have sec secondary materials within the supply chain, and this can be seen as a as a way to diversify your supply chain um, in the long term. Uh, the third one, and more a uh, more specific for for the high tech sec sector, is that collaboration across sectors especially for the small and medium enterprise, uh, is a key aspect for improving su supply chain resilience. And why we came out with this one? Well, basically was because, because all these stories. Um, with all these changes in dynamic, uh, some of the high-tech producers actually, well, they, they have that disadvantage if you consider with, uh, with, with, with big companies. Because, well, they don't produce too much volume. So in order to meet their 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 production, sometimes they have to inflate uh, their orders. So assuming that you are asking for for 200 semiconductors, why you only need 100? Because probably you will receive 80 semiconductors once that you once that you put the 200 there. Uh, so these issues we saw it like very isolated. Which means that actually, if there are more collaboration between the actors, this actually might might create a better um, well, a better way to reach out to the foundries in order uh, well to meet their orders and also to try to compete with these uh, bigger players. All right, I know that I'm a bit over time. Apologies for that, um, and also thank you for listening. I uh, hope that everything was clear, and uh, well, I'm looking forward to your and questions or comments. Thank you, uh, Glenn. I see a lot of virtual hands, but I can give a real one, so that's good. Um, thanks for your presentation. I think uh, some interesting lessons to be learned here and also some interesting insights uh, that, you, that you shared. I'm, I'm sure there will be some, uh, some questions. So yeah, if you have any questions, just uh, either open your mic or uh, raise your hands. Yako? Yes, uh, thank you, Glenn, for a very interesting uh, presentation. And what I wanted to say is that uh, this resilient and strategies, it can be very different in, in, in different, say, industries or sectors. So some of the strategies, you see them, and then others, they are uh, still scaling up. Uh, we see that a lot in semiconductors that we increasingly rely on uh, a fewer set of companies. And uh, we have this uh, uh, famous uh, Taiwanese company that uh, the, no country can, can live without anymore. Um, and that also uh, brings me to uh, say, um, uh, the, the system dynamics or the causal diagram that you showed. And indeed, I, I wanted to say that I agree that's uh, quite simplified. <laughs> That's of course a good way to start with, but it doesn't show uh, much of the nuance that I haven't seen, and it does not really uh, uh, has a place for, say, the power positions. So what really happens in these uh, supply chains, these global value chains, is that uh, certain actors or countries are have more power, and they can close their boundaries. They they prevent just from uh, exporting foods. How that works for chips, I do not really know. Uh, and and so what in the end really happened in the car industry that the car industries uh, had the contracts, but it just it was not that they stopped actually uh, stockpiling because they were st still in this just in time paradigm, and then in the end they they had to uh, go well at the end of the queue because others had taken their places. So it's also not only due to the external uh, factors and developments like the COVID, it's also due to the decisions that they take. And sometimes it's good to downsize as soon as possible to prevent any losses. But here it's been like uh, uh, a strategic failure or a misjudgment uh, that they were not ready uh, to get back. So can you say something on these points? Uh, uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, first of all, thank you, Jaco. I mean, I I agree with you, especially with with the approach that we that we took. Actually, we're very cautious to talk about. Okay, this is not the real world, but we are trying actually to say something about it, right? Um, 
one of the things uh, uh, that that we did, especially for the presentation, is to to reduce the number of levels of the of the supply chain. So, for example, for the semiconductor produ uh, production, we already know, and there are like very comprehensive comprehensive system dynamic models that shows the division between the foundry that produce the wafers and also the, the ensembling of, of the semiconductors. So in our larger model that is in Benzim, those elements are, are in place indeed. Um, regarding the ones about power position and like this uh, dynamic that can take decisions within a specific uh, company, right? That is like the more dominant. Um, we didn't include that, but it would be really interesting to analyze it to, towards that position. Um, actually, I don't, I don't recall any of the of the current uh, more complex system dynamic models for semiconductor industries that actually takes this in, into, into account. Um, maybe one of the reasons is because it's very difficult to verify, right? I mean, we know that it's there. We know that the internal decisions that I don't know that Apple or Intel can take might, might have an important role within the whole supply chain. But, uh, well, we don't know like how large. I mean, it's very difficult and I don't know that if, whether they can be very open about it. <laughs> but uh, yeah, indeed, I totally agree with you. That is something that it should be included within the model. Um, another additional point is that we try to isolate a lot of variables in order to focus on what was the COVID dynamic. Um, it was very interesting when we start <laughs> because, I mean, we, COVID was the trendy. We want to understand what happened within the dis disruption and also thinking to future possibilities, right? Um, interesting enough, one of the test mining techniques that we used was on Twitter. And if you follow Twitter, uh, well, the text mining uh, tool that we use, and um, indeed you, you can see that 2021 was all about um, semiconductor shortage related to COVID. Suddenly, when we developed the analysis at the beginning of 2022 this year, um, well, you can imagine what happened. COVID, Disappear completely from the narrative, and we start to talk about the Russian conflict, you know, Russian Ukraine conflict. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> it's it's kind of the tricky part of actually try to, to simplify it or or use a case study that is happening in real time. Um, so it's very challenging, but definitely I agree with with most of your points. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's a nice example of that is always most about the most recent or the, the mostly felt uh, disruption. I think the interesting thing about these things are that they're kind of connected, right? I mean, they're both um, a result in, in supply chain uh, crunches uh, somewhere. I mean, now it's, of course, natural gas is the big thing in, in, in the, uh, the, the war in Ukraine. But 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 you can also see in, in COVID, it was all kinds of other things. First, it was medical equipment like ventilators and, 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 and right, um, yeah, personal protection stuff. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Uh, and, uh, and 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 later on, it became um, uh, the, the vaccines and the the, the the things related to that. And and now we're talking about natural gas, but they're all kind of connected in a way that they are, well, supply chain crunches because of disruptions in the yeah. system somewhere of different but, of different nature. Yeah. But these responses are uh, examples of uh, adaptiveness, eh? so adaptive yeah, yeah, capacity yeah. that the 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 uh, focus is on the most urgent uh, problem. Right. Yeah. If, Whether yeah, that fully uh, works is another thing, but it's 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 part of the resilience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. indeed, yeah. And um, I mean, just to simplify it even even more regarding the uh, the changing the changing in well in the narrative and also the dynamic uh, uh, with this uh, Russian Ukraine uh, uh, conflict. Well, I was thinking, well, you know, there is no production of semiconductors, neither in Ukraine, neither in Russia. We know that most of the raw materials for semiconductors come from China. So how come, right? Well, guess what? Um, the major producer of neon, uh, the gas, is Ukraine that contains 70 percent. And the gas is used in the process of the of of creation of of making the the integrated circuits, so that is still yeah. <laughs> that is still connected with the semiconductor supply chain. 
So right well, now think... we're not only talking about the chip uh, shortage, we're talking about the immune shortage. Yeah. And, and, and what it nicely shows, I think, is that supply chains are nowadays so complex and depend on so many little things that come from everywhere. Everything's connected to everything. This is what this shows. So one little component, one little uh, chemical that is produced only in one place or so that suddenly can disrupt a, a, a billions or, or multi-billion uh, euro industry. Um, I think these are these are things that we have to understand that 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 um, from an economic perspective and a supply chain and production perspective, everything's connected to everything. Uh, and, and that's why I, I have a question for you, Glenn, um, because what you can see as a response to this as a kind of, well, it's kind of a puff of reaction, I would say. It's, it's like um, that um, um, uh, countries like the US, but also the EU is, try, uh, is trying to scramble uh, to uh, reshore these industries, to get these uh, uh, TSMCs also in in their own in their own country to develop their industries and now billions of of dollars and euros are are spent on actually getting these industries back into those regions uh, to be uh, become less dependent let's say of global supply chains and so I think the neon example clearly shows that yeah you can do that. Uh, but even then, you're connected to all kinds of other things somewhere out there. So you're still connected. So, so I'm I'm just wondering what your view on that on that is. So, so how useful is it to really go for for reshoring these uh, these industries? Well, this is a very interesting question, Rene, and actually brought me back to well to to my whole um, to my whole period as a sustainability scientist, right? Because I mean, we understand that one of the largest impacts that, that, that we have in, in um, environmental impacts are related to transport of goods, right? And global trade in general has like an important component uh, of this. So for many years, I thought that a, well, the solution actually was the, re the regionalization and reshoring, near shoring, uh, uh, however you would want to call it, but just bring back things close together, right? And consume yeah, yeah. locally. You can even uh, hear the term French shoring nowadays. <laughs> yeah, even French shoring, exactly. Yeah, um, I have to say that I think that I've been, uh, now that I'm looking into supply chains and the complexity that you mentioned, I think that I, I've been quite naive on thinking that you can do that. Because indeed, I mean, for for so many uh, raw materials, uh, you don't have the capacity. I mean, just just take the example of the EU. Uh, if we think about the whole uh, energy transition and all the raw materials that, that we need for making in, within Europe, uh, well, we, we don't have the stock of materials to make it. So we still require to get, I don't know, well, the semiconductors, right? So uh, as a raw material, silicon metal, we need to have a seal the, to get the lithium from the batteries uh, from somewhere else. So um, I think that is a good way to think towards a long-term strategy. However, it's important to be realistic of what things can be uh, like reshoring and what things cannot. And uh, of course, this requires also international collaboration, right? It's not about just thinking about selfish in one region, but also thinking what happened elsewhere, right? A, right. but a, yeah, so I'm, I don't know, I'm, I'm not quite convinced that it's completely the way to go, at least for, for all the, for all the needs that, that, that we have as a society, so. I think, I think for the US they calculated that they would have to double the workforce at the level uh, that you would need in those, in those plants to actually reshore, um, well, the, the, the chip industry that they would need for, for, for their own production. So and yeah. that's so that's another connection basically connected to, yeah, it's one thing to talk about material flows, et cetera, but it's another thing to really have also uh, the people that can actually do the job <laughs> and yeah. are educated yeah. in the right way. So yeah. And and maybe if I may add before Jaco comments, a uh, I mean, and, and right now I think that the discussion we're thinking more about abiotic materials, right? And durable goods. When we think about biotic materials and especially food system, this one comes more complicated. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, I'm from Central America. I love my avocados, no matter in which part of the world I am. <laughs> and I don't think that we will have actually in, in a short term avocados uh, production in, in Europe. So how yeah. I come to satisfy my, my demand in that sense? 
Yeah. Of course, we can think more about you know adapting and well and, and use what is regionally or locally produced. Uh, that's that's a good way to go. But well, in reality, it's more complex. Uh, Jacob, yes, please. <laughs> just. Yeah, well, just adding on on this uh, food companies. I when I did interviews about 20 years ago, then the uh, Unilever uh, people said already that their strategy was to have like uh, uh, to to diverse their supplies uh, for uh, food and diary so that they do not rely on a single continent just in case of the weather uncertainties and the climate uncertainties in normal times. So they do that already deliberately for, for a very long time at the, say, the high level. And what I wanted to add is the, uh, this is really interesting uh, first work or exploratory work. But of course, you rely a lot on first like a, 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 a good assessment of the system and its vulnerabilities and uncertainties. Say uh, we have colleagues that 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 combine that, uh, put that in separate modeling. Uh, they call that uh, people like Jan Wackel. They they work with the exploratory modeling. Uh, and the other thing is that of course the system dynamics shows the dynamics of the systems that can evolve. And then that gets interesting. That I also wanted to ask about: Did you consider or think of uh, different scenarios? And then uh, adding to what, what Rene already uh, uh, touched upon is that then you also want to say something, uh, do scenario analysis uh, in the sense of uh, what are then the implications of the scenarios, uh, not only in, say, uh, increasing the resilience or reducing the uncertainties, but also what that may mean for you as a country or uh, a society uh, if you have to work more or need also then to have the, the workforce and if you don't have that, you, you uh, may rely, start relying on, on immigration or more immigration, just to mention one thing. Yeah, that's uh, thanks, uh, Jaco. Again, that's a very good point. Um, yeah, we did not consider a scenario analysis in this one, but of course, I mean, this this is the, the, the next step, right? A, uh, in general, it was a very short project, <laughs> so we, we didn't have enough time to go towards like more this. Um, I, I mean, we, we, we just focused on, on the empirical evidence more, more or less, right? And um, I think that what you are suggesting, especially try to to move from 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 the descriptive mo model towards a more quantitative one. That uh, that would be very useful in, in order to to have different scenarios and scenario analysis yeah. with it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean it, it was just matter of of time. No, of course, <laughs> of, it's, of it's research, all but, suggestions uh, yeah. for further work that that you may have found yourself as well. But that's it. Yeah. It's just interesting. It's intriguing. It's a very nice topic. Yeah, definitely. What what I would suggest. And of now course, there are also some some others around the world that also start working on the COVID effects on supply chains or on value chains. Uh, I occasionally come across uh, Joe Sarkis from from uh, Massachusetts, somewhere in Massachusetts, who's doing really a lot and very nice work on that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and. Um... Um, I think that, that this indeed also opens uh, a lot of possibilities for collaboration between uh, Leiden and, uh, and Delft, actually. Uh, we are working together on one of the projects, uh, Resilience, which is about uh, rare earth magnets, where we also work together with uh, uh, Willem Alping, um, who does a system dynamics part in that, uh, in that, uh, that project. Uh, so together with Jesse Bradley, and Jesse has presented in this group also, um, she, she's really diving into the, the system dynamics, uh, well, using system dynamics to, to really look in very much detail on, on metal supply chains and, and see what kind of uh, scenarios we can expect for the future. I think that's a, that's one very valuable step, but of course, yeah, then if you focus on, on, on one specific metal, you, you have the opportunity to go a bit more uh, in depth, so to say, into that, uh, that one, uh, one thing. And, and, and this was more kind of a, a global overview of those, uh, those mechanisms, but plenty of uh, interesting stuff to be done yet. Uh, yeah. yeah. Say in, in, in my or our department, there's also Tina Comes. Mm -hmm. And she's uh, also leading our resilience lab, but they are still more on, on say, uh, natural disasters and more on the climate adaptation or the climate risk side. But uh, I'm actually trying to get her more into the circularity uh, topic as well. 
yeah. uh, because uh, circular economy is also an economy that should be more resilient. So, so there is there is a, a lot to gain from that body of knowledge and, and expertise uh, for, for us as well. Yeah, yeah, excellent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think I think we should also. Um, um, well, maybe maybe we should also inv invite her at a certain moment to to also talk about uh, uh, her take on, on on resilience and maybe drag her in a bit like that uh, <laughs> to uh, if you can give a presentation and maybe focus uh, focus it a bit uh, the, towards our topics. I think that might might be interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, any other questions from the audience? I don't want to surprise you, but I see that Taco, Taco Westerhuis, you're here from the Ministry of, of Foreign Affairs. I don't want to <laughs> involve you without you being willing to be involved, but but maybe you have some reflections on, on, on how you, from your side, look at, at this, uh, this resilience of supply chains and things like reshoring of industries. Is that something that, um, that you have some thoughts on? Do you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. well, ju just just one one uh, thought that came up with uh, at, at the moment when we're talking uh, uh, about these matters is that at the moment there's a lot of attention for uh, raw materials. Uh, you know, after the uh, the developments in uh, in in the east of Europe, um, and and so that connection from a policy point of view is 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 becoming very important in the in the coming half year when uh when i and and uh, together with colleagues from the different ministries that are involved in circular economy and 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 raw materials policies are writing a note for uh, for parliament about that so i think in the in the, in the coming uh, talks that would be interesting and thank you for organizing this uh, again um that would be a, a for from my perspective a very uh, uh timely uh um subject to uh, to include in these talks yeah yeah thanks um and and indeed uh, the um uh, the grondstoffenstrategie as uh, as it uh, as it is called in dutch uh, uh, should be i think it should be published before the end of the year right um, yeah, and uh, I saw also there was already a, a meeting planned on the 7th of October, organized by HCSS mm -hmm. uh, on that topic. And unfortunately, on a day that I'm teaching all day, basically. But uh, <laughs> okay, okay. Things like but that. The, but, but the connection with with, yeah. with circular economy is um, you know is very important because yeah, yeah. there is a tendency to uh, to put a lot of emphasis on the uh, you know the, the the political side and the dependencies. Uh, parts, but uh, the, the real role of circular economy in in that is, uh, I think, extremely important. Uh, not not as the solution, but as one of the solutions to the uh, the problem. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So also in this this resilience project, uh, which is focused on rare earth elements, so basically the the stuff that you need for the magnets in wind turbines and and, and EVs, but also in all kinds of other products. Um, there we really uh, combine those uh, th those two. So we're really looking at uh, the the primary production and the possibilities for that to to get that from other sources than China, but also uh, to uh, um, uh, to also uh, secure secondary supply basically from all the materials that we already have if in Europe and developing new methodologies for the extraction of these magnets from those uh, those products. So I think that that's very important and. Well, my my one line nowadays is that we are moving away from a society that is based and focused on securing the supply of a continuous inflow of uh, energy sources like coal, oil and gas or fossil fuels. And, and, and securing that is crucially important, especially now, of course, with the situation in Ukraine and natural gas is a big issue. We can we can feel that right now. But we're moving away from that society to a society where we are actually going to foster a stock of metals in society, metals involved in uh, in embedded in, in, in solar cells, in wind turbines, in electric electricity grids, but also in EVs, for example. And that is a and that is a circular society, basically. If you want to do that in a sustainable way, circularity is crucial for that. So circularity in that sense is very much connected to the new and and and, and uh, low carbon energy system, I would say. And uh, I think that's where the, where, where you know, everything comes together, basically. Uh, yeah. 
Um, may, may I add something to, sure. to that, Renee? So, yeah, first of all, yeah, thanks, uh, Taco, for, for, for your comments. Uh, just to let you know, uh, as a part of this screen project, also we develop a, a review on the demand for critical raw materials. And besides this, uh, besides the demand side, actually, we, we go into the, the further implications of this demand for critical raw materials. And the circularity potential that you're suggesting is one of the things that we uh, that, that we talk about that on, on the report. Um, I think that it should be publicly available, right, Renee? I, I think so, so too. Yeah. Yeah. I think so maybe maybe, yeah. We, 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 maybe we can share it with Taco because I think yeah. that is more or less in the way that that yeah. that uh, he's suggesting. Um, yeah. <laughs> also, I mean, I I totally understand the, the the pressure from the policy side actually because we are re really running out of time with the <laughs> with the criticality assessment and the fact sheets for for the for the European Commission so <laughs> I, I can relate to that story as well I mean it's uh, it's it's yeah. definitely I mean we, we have to do it very soon but uh, yeah I think that we can start from there actually Taku if you are interested we, we I can share it with you or maybe Rene just uh, let us know and yeah. Uh, yeah. Would really appreciate it. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it sounds yeah. like a great topic for another circular industry stock as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> so, Glenn, you're invited again. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah, you take the words right out of my mouth. And that's <laughs> Good. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, and 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 uh, Taco. Uh, I mean, we, we would also be happy to uh, to at a certain t a time also um, um, uh, come to your office and, and and discuss the things that we have been doing and and also because we've doing a lot of, we've been doing a lot of stuff in, in in terms of critical raw materials, all kinds of projects with uh, related to circularity, but also related to just describing um, uh, critical raw materials and and and, and the future demand of those, for example, based on different scenarios. So we would be happy to. Uh, uh, to spend some time on that and uh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, share our insights. Yeah, let's do that. I mean, uh, I, I I I drive past uh, Leiden um, almost every day, so uh, I can also come to you. Oh, that would be yeah. great. Yeah, it's just uh, one extra uh, uh, stop in between. Yeah, <laughs> you're very much invited. So let me know when 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 you would be available, and we can uh, we can arrange that. Yeah. Okay. Um, any other questions? I don't see any hands raised, so I... Hi, uh, Rani. Ah, uh, hi! <laughs> yeah, I, I might have a question. So you were talking about uh, rare earth magnets, and that sparks my interest because my thesis is uh, related to that. Mm -hmm. So I was just wondering, like, uh, are you aware of any legislations that are coming in place or, yeah, at a national level and at an EU level um, that, that are targeted towards the rare earth elements? Um... I'm I'm not sure about legislation. Um, I mean, there are there are more broader uh, uh, le legislate legislative frameworks that can influence rare earths. I'd say, like the product environmental footprints and so forth, uh, that are coming from the EU. Um, I don't know of any regulations particularly aimed at at rare earths. I don't think there are at the moment. Um, uh, so I haven't seen them yet. So, so I don't think that we are the, those are available or they, those are in the making even, I think, yeah. But what kind of legislation were you thinking about? About, for example, uh, did there are more general things like like re, re, um, demand for recycled content of different products, et cetera, et cetera. But, but that's not what you're looking at, uh, what you're asking Yeah, for. mainly towards uh, the recycling perspective of the rare earth elements, like from the magnets. So I, I think yeah. there are no specific ones, for, no specific ones for the rare earths, but I think they, they no, they of course uh, are taken into account in these more general frameworks. Yeah, but it is yeah, an in think... interesting one because I think uh, from just a technical perspective, if if we look at well, the main demand will be from EV motors in the future, and yeah. um, the business case uh, for EV for for wind turbine magnets, there's an easy business case because they're they're large, they you know where they are, it's business to business. This all this all works fine. 
But uh, since the, the, the bulk of the material will be in EV motors, um, uh, that's very problematic from a business, pay, uh, uh, business case perspective because you only have, let's say, a few kilograms of material. Let's say it's, a, it's worth a few hundred euros of, of, uh, of value. And then you have to manually take out the motor, take out the rotor, yeah. take out the magnets. Well, before you know it, this few hundred euros is, is, is evaporated in, in labor costs. So that's uh, yeah. that's a really problematic one, and and one in which legislation could actually play a, an important role in in uh, creating a better business case uh, because of let's say um, regulations for uh, take back systems for for OEMs or or design for recycling or things like that. Yeah. Yeah, I was talking to some motor and generator recycling companies here in the Netherlands, and they told mm -hmm. me that yeah, the labor charges are too high, so we just export the motors to third countries and yeah. they take care of the recycling but in that particular instance the magnets also get lost with them yeah because i so, think yeah. the only thing that they then take out is the copper because that's the most valuable part of the motor yeah uh, and then the magnets are just yeah it's just become waste somewhere uh, in in a place where you don't want to have it also yeah yeah, yeah. No, good point. And uh, yeah, interesting. Uh, I mean, th th this this can be a very interesting. I'm not sure what what your what, what your research question is, but it could be a very interesting research question. Like we are now looking at leakages from from our our um, um, plastic recycling system and plastics getting lost in in developing countries. I think this could be a similar issue if we really try to make scenarios for where would these magnets end up in the end if we are really exporting these motors. Uh, and if that's allowed, I think that's that's a very interesting uh, topic. Yeah, yeah, my topic is related to designing collection strategies for the magnets that are present in EVs and wind turbines. Okay. But yeah, wind turbines is is relatively easier than uh, yeah EVs. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I already asked you at a certain time, but but who are your your supervisors? <laughs> it's uh, Jaco and uh, Marcel from yeah TPM okay. department. And cool. actually, uh, the share is Tina Comes. Yeah, ah, okay. yeah okay. so that makes them the uh, circle <laughs> around again. Yeah. Uh, um, so, then just ask to you or to anyone else here: uh, Are there there aren't any regulations coming? I understand that, but how easy or how good would it work if something like um, uh, a certain percentage for secondary use of neodymium uh, for these magnets uh, would become obligatory or would be considered? Well, um, I think that would certainly work, but, but the issue is that we are now in a, in a huge ramp up of demand, so to say. So that can only be a very low percentage, but even if it's a low percentage, if you, if yeah. you would say, well, 5% has to come from recycled uh, material, that would still be very useful, I think, because it will create a market in that sense. Yeah. Yeah, well, the regulation is always that it works better if they do not... Uh... Um, well, there, there is uh, enough time to adjust to them uh, to get them implemented. So, so, so you need to get started with that for the future uh, right. demand or the future reuse. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, good point. Okay. Um, Thank you all for uh, for joining. Thank you, uh, Glenn, for uh, sharing your uh, uh, your work. And um, yeah, see you. Uh, see you next time. I think next time. Uh, let me have a look. When is that? Um, that will be on the 28th of September, and then we will have uh, Rosa Yunsu, uh, a master student, uh, looking at critical materials for electric aviation. Also a very interesting topic. <laughs> okay. Perfect. Thank you. Have a great day. Yeah. Have a good day. Thanks, guys. Bye. Thank you.